industry. Not only that, he is a member of expert of many ministries of government of India. Dr. Sharma has filed 24 patents and published 341 papers in National and International Journal of Reviews. He has contributed 54 book chapter for 54 chapters in the book and also edited 14 books. So we are eagerly waiting to hear from you. So I have I'll hand over to you, sir. I will welcome you, sir, for the session. Thank you, Dr. Ganpe, for a nice introduction. Uh, can okay. I have my slides? Sure, sir. You can go ahead with your slides, sir. Yeah, is it visible to everybody? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, might be. Uh, this is the second slide or so? This is the first slide. Uh, oh, great. Okay, can you start? Sure, sure, sir. Sure. So I first of all thank uh, Society of Pharmaceutical Education and Research for uh, this nice international online conference, organizing this nice international online conference on the very apt and timely thematic that is involving pharmacists for next generation to improve health and wellness. And in the context of COVID-19, I look it at uh, to help manage the current situation as well as prepare for what may happen in the future. So I look at a uh, three-phase uh, strategy. In the first phase, we have to mobilize all resources. We are passing through this phase. We have to secure ourselves. We have to ensure safety of all our loved ones and ourselves and establish a response structure. Already, I think government of India is doing very well and is uh, lauded the word over for their effort. And in this phase, uh, we have to look at some preventive uh, uh, prophylactic uh, measures. We don't have any vaccine as on date. There is no specific treatment modality available. So we have to, I think, uh, see that our immunity is high and also we take some agents in more quantity, like we take a lot of condiments in our uh, uh, food. So condiments like ginger and garlic, I'll tell you reasons why ginger and garlic I'm mentioning specifically in the course of my slide. And then in the second phase, we have to stabilize, we have to develop tactical response to the challenges of navigating the COVID-19 new normal uh, uh, there is, uh, uh, we have to look for some new uh, promising molecule or maybe repurpose drug. And one such drug which comes to my mind is 2 deoxyd glucose on which I worked in the last decade of the last century under the able guidance of Professor Vinay Jain. Uh, so I will, uh, in the last, I just give you one or two slides on uh, this compound, how it appears promising uh, as a mitigator for uh, uh, this uh, deadly virus. And uh, we are also developing, everybody in the whole world is uh, uh, looking at COVID-19 vaccine. And then we have to strategize a design, a strategy to emerge stronger in the post-COVID economy, what we call as a new normal. And we have to gear up with accelerated speed to all these uh, phases. So the title which I have chosen for today is Gingiver of Snail as adjuvant against uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa and possibly SARS-CoV-2. The first portion of this talk was basically the PhD work of Dr. Ankita, who is uh, in the chat room with us. And uh, the second phase we did uh, when I was stuck up in lockdown in Delhi, so I thought we should do something and uh, do some theoretical research because we are not having access to our labs. So I requested Ankita, who is my uh, past PhD student, and uh, Dr. Pallavi, who is presently uh, working with uh, Patanjali uh, in ha uh, Haridwar, so with the help of uh, these two, uh, my PhD students, uh, we were able to come out with uh, three very interesting modalities. So one I will be discussing in detail. For the rest two, I will just be giving you glimpses. So Ginger we will be talking mainly today. And uh, this is the outline of my presentation. One or two slides I will share on antimicrobial resistance, which is a, a very alarming situation nowadays. And uh, then we'll talk about Pseudomonas aeruginosa, the uh, causative organism for uh, uh, causing uh, this. Uh, sir, sorry to uh, sir, sorry to interrupt. Sir, slides are not visible. Slides are not visible to the audience. Sir, sorry to interrupt you, sir. Uh, okay. Madam, we are fixing the issue. That is the issue with the YouTube actually. So we are fixing the issue. In the meantime, we can go ahead with the discussion because audio is uh, like uh, uh, audience will be able to hear uh, the sir's uh, talk as well as of now. Okay. And I I request Ankita she has got a copy of my slide if she can share with you and you can uh, run it at your level side by side. Ankita, can you help us in this? Uh, uh, sir, not yes, required. Sir, uh, sir, sir uh, Sharma, sir, not required, sir, because this is a. Sir, now it's visible on YouTube as well, sir. It's okay, visible okay, now. Good. 
Yeah, we fix the issue. So, right, sir. Pseudomonas yes. aeruginosa is a priority one antibiotic resistance pathogen. And we have done a rational based bioprospection study. I will just give you what are the steps involved in this uh, study. And then we have uh, came out with two very interesting herbals. One is ginger, other is uh, uh, one more uh, herbal we have selected, which I will show you in the end. And uh, for ginger, obviously, after selecting it, uh, we have made some extraction and did some characterization, etc. I will go through all the steps. And then we did efficacy testing both in in vitro studies and in vivo models and toxic, toxicity studies. And uh, then uh, uh, these results were published in a number of reputed journals and uh, Dr. Ankita uh, was awarded PhD thesis on that. So as a part two of this work, we extended this work for targeting uh, host viral protein interaction at entry point of SARS-CoV-2. We'll discuss in detail uh, what was our hypothesis and uh, what are the steps involved and how did we go around it. And then, as I said, we'll discuss uh, glimpses about uh, one of the major constituents of uh, garlic, that is gamma glutamyl s allyl cysteine, uh, which demonstrated very interesting uh, uh, properties. And two deoxidase glucose, which is an anti-metabolite of glucose, uh, we'll discuss with the help of one or two slides in the end. Anti-microbial resistance is the ability of a microbe to resist the effect of medication from working under uh, against this microbe. Antibacterial resistance is a subset of antimicrobial resistance, which is specific to bacterial resistance. And new resistance mechanisms are emerging and spreading globally, threatening our ability to treat common infectious diseases, resulting in prolonged illness, disability, and death. Uh, this is uh, mainly uh, uh, when we talk about uh, this uh, organism. Mainly, uh, we uh, put uh, five organisms, and they are called as escape pathogens. So I have listed this escape pathogen on the uh, bottom left of my slide. And if you look at the hospital acquired infection and uh, otherwise nosocomial infection, so uh, we are seeing that uh, Indian situation is quite alarming and the world situation is also global situation is quite alarming. And uh, we have to prepare a second line of defense or say some adjuvants against the present antibiotic because antibiotic research is a very slow this thing, new antibiotics are not emerging for old antibiotic resistance has been developed by this uh, microorganism. So we have to act in a very cautious way. If you look at the common nosocomial infection, uh, there could be bloodstream infection, urinary tract infection, or ventilator-required pneumonia. Uh, see, we are now seeing with the COVID-19, a uh, lot of people are needing ventilator support. So uh, besides COVID, they may also acquire ventilator-required pneumonia. And there are uh, some agents uh, which are involved in uh, this type of nosocomial infection. They are pseudomonas aeruginosides on the top, and then uh, these are the other organisms which are uh, contributing to this uh, uh, nosocomial uh, infection that is ventilator-required infection. If you look at pathogenesis of uh, uh, this uh, pseudomonas pneumonia, and uh, this is a slide which is showing how it is uh, uh, attaching to the bacterial cell, uh, to the epithelial cell layer, and then how it is getting entry, and then other steps which are involved in the pathogenesis. This is very important to study because our strategies are designed basically on this whole mechanism. There is a six step methodology we follow for bioprospection. We go for classical literature search, herbal bioprospection, molecular docking, in silico toxicity prediction, in silico bioactivity prediction, and the first step, which is selection of potential herbal leads and then collection, processing of herbal, selection of part of the plant to be used, selection of extraction solvent, herbal extraction, ultimately we go for it, and then we characterize this extracts uh, so that uh, we have uh, uh, bioactivity fingerprinting also with us to uh, uh, reduce batch to batch variation. Then we go for isolation and characterization of uh, these isolates and in vitro uh, uh, antimicrobial efficacy testing. The standardization of disease cycle in a murine model uh, study of disease parameters in vivo antimicrobial efficacy testing. And finally, we try to throw some light on the mechanistic aspect of how these drugs are acting. We do some experiments to prove whether it is acting as an addition uh, inhibition or forum sensing inhibition or beta lactamase inhibition in case of CRE uh, group of drugs and hemolysin inhibition, then cell uh, uh, ultra structure disruption. So all these things have been uh, done uh, in the present study. I will not go into detail. So bias processing studies, as I said, uh, the first step is identification of the bioactivity parameter of pseudomonas aeruginosa. 
then we go for evaluation of percentage relevance in the weightage of each uh, bioactivity parameter. Then we go for classical bioprospection based preparation of large database of herbal, binary matrix based selection of herbal, and weightage calculation of selected herbals. And ultimately, with the help of Fuji scoring, we arrive at some uh, agents which could be more promising. So some uh, results I am showing it on the sites. I will not be discussing in detail. Validation by molecular docking uh, approach. 10 product predominant phytoconstituents were selected from 38 uh, plants. And 380 phytoligands in total were uh, docked with the physiological receptor that is exozyme exoenzyme S and uh, exotoxin A. 14 phytoligands, that is 6 from uh, Glycerizia glabra, uh, 4 from, uh, 2 from uh, Terminalia uh, tabula, uh, 2 from Mensa piperata, and uh, uh, we took also from gingiver office nails were showing E values higher than standard, which was amikacin in this case, where the value was 309.75 minus. Selection of five herbal uh, uh, was the resultant of this, uh, which could be an uh, open test to pursue study. And they were Glycerizia glabra, uh, Mulatti, what we call it, Gingiver, Officinale, Adarak, or Ginger, what we call it, Terminalia tubula, Mensa pepreta, Aloe vera. So then we did the molecular docking approach. This is exactly what we have done. Uh, I'm not going to detail. Then we uh, go for preparation of herbal extract, then again, the collection and processing of herbals as for WHO. Uh, and other uh, pharmacognostic uh, procedures and uh, uh, extraction technology for medicine and aromatic plant uh, issued by United Nations Industrial Development Organization 2008. So we did all the studies. And then we standardized this uh, uh, phytoligands or phytochemicals. And ultimately, in the last, we went for bioactivity fingerprint screening with the help of various assays like DDPS, radical scavenging assay nitric oxide radical scavenging activity, hydroxyl radical scavenging activity, superoxide ion scavenging activity, anti-lipid peroxidation activity, and antioxidant activity in aquaspace. And then uh, we procured this uh, pathogen from uh, microbiology lab of National Center for Disease Control, and uh, went for its morphological and biochemical factorization, then EST to determine drug sensitivity profile, herbal biogram profiling, MIC and MBC were determined, and uh, 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 this is the way we went. And uh, this slide shows morphological, uh, biochemical, physiological, and drug susceptibility uh, uh, pattern uh, with the help of this microorganisms and the drugs tested. This slide shows efficacy testing of herbals against uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa uh, to determine uh, relative percentage inhibition, uh, minimum inhibitory concentration, and minimal bactericidal concentration. After this, we went for acute toxicity studies of the extract uh, we have selected from the herbal and standardization of route of infection to cause pneumonia for in vivo studies and uh, LD50 for pathogens were determined and efficacy testing were done. So these are some studies which we did with all these five extracts uh, we have taken from these five promising plants. This is a viral study since Rutomonas aeruginosa we did for calculation of LD50 by read and uh, Munch method. And these are the results. And uh, uh, then pathogenesis and potential of herbals uh, we established uh, uh, by uh, using trachomatized inoculation we did uh, in uh, Swiss albinomyce. This is uh, some studies that we have uh, done with the help of uh, microscopy. So ultimately, the resultant was these two drugs, Glycerizia glabra and gingiver officinal. They were found very promising from the herbal biospression model, and uh, uh, they could be. They had a therapeutically accepted dose range of 80 mg per kg body weight oral and 96 mg per kg body weight oral to pseudomonal pneumonia in murine model. So these are the various publications which Ankita has published, six publications coming out of this work in high impact journals. And uh, now coming to its second use that is uh, for acting as the adjuvant for uh, present COVID infection. Gingiver officinal, as we know all, already it is used as a, a uh, spice in various foods, various culinaries uh, all over the world. For centuries, it has been important ingredients in Ayurveda and the Tibeti Yunani herbal medicine for the treatment of various diseases like uh, respiratory tract infection, migraine, diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular uh, uh, care, gastrointestinal cancer, and anti-inflammatory 
uh, activity. So before we uh, went to the study, let us understand COVID because there are a number of terms which are used. Sometimes uh, they are used interchangeably and incorrectly. So COVID-19 is a coronavirus disease caused by 2019 novel coronavirus, also called as uh, SARS-CoV-2. Why this SARS-CoV-2 name is named, I'll tell you. It's a very significant and dreadful uh, virus of coronavirus family. And diseases inflicted with this uh, viruses are mainly three. The first one came in the year 2002 and 2004, again from China. It is called severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS-CoV. And then uh, Middle East respiratory syndrome, MERS-CoV, came in 2012, uh, 2015, and 2018. To distinguish uh, the present uh, uh, this uh, uh, coronavirus disease, COVID, uh, from what happened in uh, SARS-CoV infection in 2002, so we have named it as SARS-CoV-2 uh, and this naming uh, has been done as per uh, uh, the uh, International Committee on Taxonomy of Virus ICTV on the basis of genetic relatedness of the SARS-CoV-1 and CoV-2. Uh, if you look at origin and spread of COVID-19, a cluster of pneumonia cases with unidentified etiological agents were reported in Wuhan, China in uh, November 2019. Chinese health authorities confirmed that the cluster was allied with a novel coronavirus. The bushfire effect of COVID-19 compelled WHO to declare COVID-19 as a public health emergency of international concern on 31st January 2020. And WHO on 11th March uh, have uh, made the assessment that COVID-19 uh, is a pandemic now and uh, uh, because of the steep rise uh, at that time in around 114 countries. If you look at its uh, origin and etiology, there are various uh, viral vector and intermediate host. Uh, they are not confirmed again, and then uh, genotic spread uh, came to human, and the entry of uh, uh, virus through air passes mainly. It is mainly mucosa, whether it is eye mucosa, nasal mucosa, or uh, buccal mucosa, which is involved. Then binding of viral S2 glycoprotein with the host ACE2 receptor. This is a step which we are targeting, uh, which we thought at alveolar epithelium, uh, we can uh, target it. Uh, because thereafter, it uh, elicits uh, immunological response in the form of uh, cytokines and uh, other things, and then uh, lead to viremia and uh, viral virulence factors, uh, uh, which are like M protein, etc. Here are the various symptoms I need not say because everybody is now fully aware about the symptoms and some precautionary measures or preventive measures what the WHA, ICMR, etc. are advising. So ginger nail as an adjuvant, adjuvant to treat COVID-19, our interest uh, arose uh, because of the potent phytochemicals that can target the virulence factor of a pathogen that we have seen with our study with uh, uh, which I mentioned earlier. And the metabolic pathways in the biochemicals involved in pathophysiology of COVID-19 can be targeted to find out effective inhibitor molecule, targeting the individual mechanistic pathway of a pathogenesis. Identification of potent lead can be done with the help of molecular docking of in silico studies. Phytochemical from gingiver officinate like gingerol, uh, shuabol, gingiberin, gingerin on, paradol, 1-dehydro-6, gingeridion, and gingeron, etc., were assessed to find their effective binding with uh, this protein by conducting ligand receptor binding docking. And uh, we hope that uh, there will be some interesting results to be carried out. Again, to tell you this, uh, 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 things which we are targeting are mainly at uh, this uh, label S protein and ACE2 receptor. SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, utilizes their S protein as a significant part of its envelope that participate in the interaction with its cellular receptor that is angiotensin converting enzyme 2, ACE2 of host cell. ACE2 is an enzyme attached to the outer surface cell membrane of cells in the lungs, arteries, heart, kidney, and intestine. The S protein is cleaved by extracellular catalytic domain of transmembrane protease serine 2, that is TMPRS. S2, also called as serine protease or hepsin, leading to entry of virus to enter inside the cell. Attachment of uh, entry of the virus uh, is the most crucial step of the pathogenesis of SARS-CoV-2, mediated by S protein, ACE2, and further assisted by extracellular 
catalytic domain of uh, TMPR double S2 on cell membrane. So uh, this uh, interested us, and uh, uh, this is our uh, hypothesis that uh, 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 when it enters through various mucosal membranes, as I said, uh, uh, in the mouth, uh, nose, and eyes region, and then uh, how it goes around, and uh, how this AC2 and uh, spike protein they they help in uh, its uh, propagation and uh, uh, ginger as we know that uh, uh, it has uh, been reported as immunobooster antibacterial and also uh, ace2 ac2 uh, which has uh, uh, been shown that it affects uh, this thing uh, it could be interesting and also we have seen that ayush uh, ministry is also advocating its uh, use in various preparation which they are advising to increase immunity the other steps involved details, I will not go into it. Molecular docking, how we did it, then in silico bioactivity prediction, how we have done, what are the various software uh, which we have used. And then E value is calculated in molecular docking approach. The large negative E value in Y obtained with individual phytochemicals when docked with targeted protein of mechanistic pathway reflects a favorable reaction. And this two compound that is uh, gingerone. Uh, minus 284.75 kilocal per molecule and the gingeridion minus 247.8175 kilocal per molecule have shown effective binding affinity towards ACE2 and extracellular domain of the serine protease respectively compared to chemotherapeutic uh, marker drugs like uh, we are also getting out of uh, this uh, reports about use of hydroxychloroquine as a prophylactic and also as a therapeutic and also demonstrate miscellate. Uh, so these are uh, all the story with the uh, ginger and as I said with Patanjali, Dr. Pallavi, we did some experiment and this whole experiment which is sold in the first phase, uh, we targeted only for uh, coronaviruses like what we did for escape organisms, pseudomonas and all that in this study from where ginger, uh, ginger was promoted. The complete steps uh, we have taken and uh, we have taken what are the various uh, drugs or uh, uh, various condiments advised uh, in Ayurveda uh, for uh, uh, such type of ailment. And ultimately, what we found very interesting compound. Uh, this is a compound which is uh, called as gamma glutamyl S L L16. And uh, 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 this compound demonstrated highly significant binding energies with viral spikes, glycoprotein, endoriponucleases, and main proteases binding energy was found to be more than or equal to minus 490 kilocal per molecule. This we are separately communicating. The work on ginger we already communicated in the Defense Life Science Journal and it is under review. And then another interesting uh, molecule uh, which I studied uh, in the last decade of the last century uh, for my PhD work. Uh, my PhD guide, Professor Vinay Jain, he uh, gave me a call when all these things started in the month of February. He said uh, this compound, as we know, is acting. Uh, it is a compound which is almost similar to glucose, but at the second position instead of OH, we have got only H. That is called 2-deoxy D-glucose. So he said uh, this compound, uh, we know that it is uh, uh, competing with glucose for entry into uh, the cells. And then uh, as the first step of uh, glycolysis, it is uh, uh, Phosphorylated, we get 2DG6 phosphate, and uh, it is not entering into the further steps of uh, glycolysis. And uh, uh, thereafter, the energy production uh, is uh, inhibited. So, he said this is one uh, theory, and the other thing is that it is also uh, affecting glycosylation. So, he said it could be a promising modality. Why don't we check it with all the antiviral which are being used in uh, present uh, therapies? And also with uh, hydroxychloroquine and see whether in silico it can give some result. So I trust Dr. Pallavi and her group in uh, Patanjali and uh, they did some work and they find uh, it's a very interesting compound and uh, the mechanism of its action, uh, if you look at it, uh, as I said, it's a compound which uh, uh, compete with the glucose, but it is not entering into the further step of glycolysis, so there is no ATP production. And uh, this uh, novel coronavirus 19 or uh, uh, coronavirus is inactivated due to nutrient deprivation. Replications will be uh, affected. And also, then uh, we also studied uh, the various other pathways, AMP, 
activated protein kinase, phosphorylation of tuberculous uh, sclerosis, and induced expression of P53. And we found that uh, this could be a promising moiety. And already since it is a drug which has been uh, uh, used in phase one and phase two studies uh, in India itself in prosovinogen, uh, and in group he has uh, uh, treated uh, uh, in phase one and phase two glioblastoma multiforme. A grade three and four patients and increase their life expectancy with a better quality of life. And moreover, there are some reports which are indicating its use uh, as a antiviral agent in the repurposed way. So these uh, three interesting leads we obtained, which I thought of uh, sharing with you. Thank you very much for your kind attention. And uh, these are my coordinates in case you want to uh, talk to me or uh, meet me or discuss with me about this presentation or any other thing related to COVID. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Sir, so thanks a lot for your wonderful lecture, sir. So there is one query from the audience. They are telling uh, there is one natural compound which is found in the plant and that is hypercine. Hypercine. Mm -hmm. There is one natural compound found in the plant called as hypercine. Mm -hmm. It shows wide range of antiviral properties. Again, mm -hmm. different ranges of virus. Where mm -hmm. should be tested against this and COVID-19? They have tested already or uh, they are, they have not tested in situ what they have done or a viral load they have determined? Uh, no, sir. They are asking, they are asking the model where it should be tested. So they are telling yeah. if antiviral property is proven. Yeah. So uh, again, if you can send it on my email, I will again give it to uh, this group in Patanjali. And they have already got a database. Maybe they have already done this compound. And if not, then uh, they will find the e values for this compound. And then we can share with you. And if interesting, we will uh, 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 go for uh, a viral load detection with the help of NIB, some studies we can run. OK, sir. There, there, there are a lot of phytochemicals. I'm not saying uh, it's the end of uh, this thing. And these uh, two, three things which I have shared with you are the only one. There are a lot of this thing. But again, uh, instead of written trial, we have to go by a proper bioprospection model and see that uh, we only uh, uh, utilize our time because time is uh, very critical at this situation. We are not looking at uh, 10 year or 12 year cycle for getting a drug into market. We are looking at 10 or 12 month cycle at the most when the drug should be actually used in the patient. So uh, I think silico studies can help you a lot in uh, telling about the promising uh, aspect of this thing. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot for your valuable time and giving us insight and giving us a very informative talk on the how the how they are how many potentials of pharmacological potentials of herbal supplements are there against pseudomonas pneumonia and urine models and how they can act as an agent to treat the COVID-19. So I once again thank you for your valuable time, sir. Uh, and I now hand over to Prenda, sir. Take over the thank you. Thank, thank you. you sir. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, madam, for the yeah. kind help. And thank you so much, sir, for the very informative and elaborative lecture. I'm continuously following up with the comments as well. And everybody has praised like anything. It is a very informative and well-framed lecture. So thank you once again so much for the lecture, sir. You're welcome. And now we will take it forward for the second scientific talk that is given from uh, Professor Dr. Harvinder Popli. So before uh, initiating the discussion, I would like to invite the moderator, Dr. M. Vijay Kumar from Nifty University, Mangalore, to introduce the speaker and to welcome her. Over to you, uh, Dr. Vijay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nagaich, for the introduction and uh, giving such a great opportunity. So in the high times, to be connected with this uh, science and all. So, so your efforts are appreciated. So thanks for the opportunity for part, uh, giving me an opportunity to participate in this particular uh, webinar. So today we have, uh, for next session, we have a very renowned uh, person, to, so Professor Harvinder Popley. So professor, let me introduce her. So Professor Harvinder Popley is, is the Dean and Officiating Registrar at the Delhi Pharmaceutical Sciences and Research Institute, State University of Government of NCR in Delhi. So she is also a Director of DPCRU Innovation and Incubation Foundation. She is the ex-Director of Ranbaxi Research Laboratories. So wherein uh, she was a part of senior management for uh, strategy, global collaborations, acquisitions, and licensing. Her professional accomplishment from over uh, 30 years of experience in R&D, academics, industry, and field of pharmaceuticals. Yeah. So she is a gold medalist from uh, for BPharm from Delhi University in 1984, and uh, she completed her MPharm with a distinction in pharmaceuticals. 
uh, along with uh, suppose she had a post graduate diploma in business management for that she is a gold medalist for this particular course also so from ims delhi 1986 so further she continued research in novel drug delivery for steroidal drugs and completed phd from delhi university in 1991 so she awarded prestigious commonwealth fellowship in uk to pursue post doctoral research in the manchester uk during 1995 and 1996 so moreover that she authored five books three patents and three chapters in international books so she has guided more than 50 masters and uh, phd students she has more than 100 research and review articles for her credit in national and international journals so really it's a honor and a privilege to have such a great speaker today so over to you ma'am uh first of all let me thank you first and congratulate uh, dr upendra nagache you know for uh, having such a wonderful conference uh, and with a, such a overwhelming response and uh, the congratulations to entire teams you know to doing this in online platform in this uh, challenging time of uh, pandemic and thank you so much uh, dr vijay for uh, you know introducing me uh today you know uh, great to hear uh, dr uh, uh, dr rakesh sharma and uh, after a very uh, insightful uh, scientific talk i'll take you a little bit more on uh, numbers and how what is the impact of covid-19 on a pharmaceutical industry uh, as our honorable prime minister shri narendra modi he also mentioned that you know this era will be remembered as there will be a pre corona and a post corona and uh, you know the world is definitely you know changed across the sector and uh, so too in a pharma industry so broadly you know we can say there is a short term and a long term effect on the pharma industry and uh, you know the pharma industry have to change its way uh, you know even when the crisis is over you know some of the impact as mentioned by all the speakers is that the permanently you know we have adopted some of the practices uh, and will be and long after that will be practiced you know when even the pandemic is been over so these is related to the workplace as well as the lab based practices so the consciously we are adopting the social distancing practices and there is a significant shift towards the work from home for employees which is not involved in the bench work even in a pharma industry and there is a serious relook at our clinical development processes the protocols they had to be modified to make the clinical trials and the drug testing which is more streamlined to you know get the better and quicker results and there is a shift of focus on the infectious disease drug development in addition you know the cancer and the heart disease which had somehow become the focus in the big pharma in the in the recent years is now been changed so i was just looking into the numbers by the iqbia and uh, you know you would see that in this during this lockdown period we have not seen and we were talking you know in our group with some of the health care practitioners they say the surgeries has gone down the mortality with other diseases has gone down so you know in definitely this is due to uh, you know many reasons the people people are taking care and they are not going out so uh, definitely you know we see and def- and these all uh, you know the comorbidity the mortality the uh, clinical indications they are all going to impact basically you know the how the pharma industry and what are the needs basically of of that sector so to name it like immediate short term effects is uh, we had been all seen that during the lockdown it's a break in the supply chain so there was a recent survey on a healthcare professionals they said that the 95% of them are been uh, you know concerned about uh, the company's performance uh, basically you know there is concern about the supply and demand gap but not so much in a pharma industry but basically across the sector there is a uh, you know lot of impact uh, but india and china they are the main two global players in a global pharmaceutical supply chain so the spread of infections in this uh, countries you know there was poses the danger of drug shortages and uh, d- uh, we all are witness that there is hugely china we depend you know the entire world depends china for its supplies of api and also the key starting materials and intermediaries so most of the countries they have full inventories but a prolonged lockdown and now you know it's been opening up 
that has been affecting also the drug manufacturing and we don't know you know how it is going to take shape in you know in in the short term there is already a restricted export of you know the apis they prohibited the export of surgical disposable masks there is a recommendation for you know starting the local manufacturing of apis so we had seen there is a lot of impact of you know having a, everything you know to a local manufacturing uh we had seen that you know and when this pandemic or uh, uh you know there is a shortage of sanitizer there is a shortage of disinfectant there was a shortage of uh, <coughs> uh, the mask but now, now you know today in such situations we have the india also coped up and the world across you know everybody has been trying to cope up and fill that gap and uh, as uh, you know it's mentioned that you know i am one of the directors with the dipsru innovation and incubation foundation so in this challenging time there is a lot of effort done by our incubator so we had you know 15 startup companies so four of them startups you know they work towards the uh, they have made a hocl which is been uh, also you know in a been recognized by drdo and uh, they had been supplying this not only to the drdo not only to the campus but you know to a lot of others to you know maintain the challenge which is a hocl based of disinfectant or also the hand sanitizer another of our startup is working towards the mask the another startup worked on alcohol based and one of the startup is also working in you know the increasing demand and been working towards the development of a ventilator so that is the change you know we are seeing into a healthcare industry and after the you know the break in a supply chain uh, there is a rise in a drug prices which happen to increase because of the raw materials uh, even you know if you say the cost of paracetamol is also grown, grown, gone up uh, significantly the price of vitamins penicillins they have increased now india also supplies you know 60% of the global vaccine uh with the you know about uh, roughly 40 to 70% you know to which supply the satisfy the need of who's demands for dpt ebcg vaccines so prolonged covid in pandemic also affect the production and supply of uh, these vaccines if you look into the long term effects there is a change towards the drug development and the clinical practices protocols <coughs> in the fda so the protocols for drug development and the clinical practices may undergo significant changes for example uh, relaxing the regulations on a real world data which could make the clinical trial processes more comprehensive the fd also may look into a regulatory practices you know especially in terms of a review process of a generic medicine and uh, in order to shorten you know basically the drug approval process medical devices they are also you know has uh, we have seen there is a, a, a lot of regulation changes we have seen in the last two years even in india and even globally and after this pandemic we saw a acute shortage of ventilators in the best of the countries in the world so hence the keeping a buffer stock for a important medical devices is also a new norm fda might also think the number of inspections on the overseas and the manufacturing plants uh they may also delegate the certain responsibility to the other organization for example you know one of the example is the respirators which has been available now this is the cda which recently announced that there are certain res uh, respirators which is regulated by them and not by the fda can also be used so we have seen lot of relaxations on this regulatory authorities and uh, as we seen that there is a long queue always in fda so there are other regulatory authorities they also gain you know may gain the power besides the fda in drug and medical instruments i mean so that you know the products are available devices are available commonly you know to the people now response to the virus in developing the antiviral therapeutic now there have been all round efforts by the pharma companies which is focused on developing a vaccines you know as a anti covid medication so as of today when we talked about the who they brief about 7 to 8 vaccine candidates which is in the pipeline and to be tested as a potential vaccine so that might we don't know you know how much time it will take up you know but roughly you know we are anticipating at least 12 to 18 months to develop while you know it can be 
shortened to say eight months. That's the, you know, anybody is kind of a guess. Uh, another, which is most talked about uh, drug is the Ramdesivir, which is uh, maybe a potential cure. We don't know yet. And that has shown some benefits basically in a second stage of disease. And this is from a Gilead Sciences, which is, you know, this is effective against from a moderate to a severe disease. And these results are based on the clinical trials of medications on about 6,000 of the patients. And uh, from the Gilead Sciences, you know, the, even the Indian companies have started responsing. And we have now, you know, the royalty free licenses with the FLA, Jubilant Life, Hetero Labs, Smilin Labs, and also one of the Pakistan based uh, Feroz Sons Laboratory. And uh, until a new cure of the vaccine has been found. So these five companies, you know, are being uh, allowed to distribute this remdesivir in, a, you know, about 127 of the countries. Now, you know, if you look today, you know, the complete prospect of it. Now, India Pharma, you know, which when we talk about this gamble on a cure for uh, uh, COVID-19, remdesivir comes from Gilead Sciences, you know, uh, anticipated cost of this is single vial is about 5,000 rupees and approximately 1 lakh for the entire treatment and is effective for the moderate to severe cases. But that is an injectable kind of a product. Uh, another one talked about is the, you know, the hydroxychloroquine and, uh, you know, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of noise, you know, when the US government and the Trump, you know, have this but, you know, still we don't have a complete, uh, uh, you know, the uh, the complete, ample, uh, basically the proof of that, you know, that product has been effective or has been kind of a useful. While, you know, there is different opinions, many of these studies, you know, which has been shown by uh, the, uh, by uh, uh, basically, you know, being uh, vouched by, uh, by that, that, you know, it has been kind of effective, but there is no sure this about it. Another product which is now being, is being talked about is a Febipravi. It's a broad spectrum antiviral from uh, Toyama Chemicals uh, based in Tokyo, and that's effective for a mild to moderate cases. Now, Glenmark has launched uh, phase three trials in India. And uh, Cipla and Stride Pharma has also applied for a phase three. While, you know, there is a Breton, which is a Pune-based company, they have, uh, you know, since the clinical trial, so there is no marketing authorization in India. But, you know, they have already launched in about 18 other countries where, you know, uh, 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 where uh, there is no kind of, uh, these kind of uh, regulations and they started, you know, exporting those patches and started producing. So that is, you know, one of the things which we are expecting. The expected cost is around 12,000 for the entire therapy, and uh, this is the oral formulation, so that can be administered at home. Cipla also secured a, uh, earlier the exclusive license for a Roche for a toclizumabam in 2018, which is approved for rheumatoid arthritis, and that is also being considered as one of the options for a COVID-19 cases. Uh, the 400 milligram of this ectoma is. The cost is about 40,000, but the treatment price is very uncertain because we, we don't know that, you know, how many of the doses which will be required. There are about, uh, you know, if you name it, there are 30 Indian, about 100 global COVID-19 vaccines, which is development, candidate in development. While in the previous slide, I mentioned that six to seven or to eight, which WHO has been talking about. And uh, in fact, my previous speaker has talked about, you know, something related to Patanjali. So, even the Patanjali group has joined the global efforts and then doing some trials and some vaccines in Jaipur and Indore. Uh, ICMR is in the lead and has been working with the Bharat Biotech. The Serum Institute has tied up with the uh, Oxford uh, University. Uh, internationally, if you'll see that the US-based uh, Modera uh, is in the finished stage at one clinical trial. And Chinese vaccine maker, the CanSino, is also a very strong contender. The Oxford University vaccine is based on basically a weakened strain of adenovirus, which has been in the common cold, and that has been combined with the genetic material of a SARS-CoV-2 protein, Novavax, and US has also begun the phase two trials. Uh, Pfizer has joined hands with the Germany to develop a vaccine. So these are, you know, few of the leads uh, in terms of a vaccine. Now this COVID-19, the key impacts, you know, if we'll see into a 
pharmaceutical market, it impacts the innovation. So there is a short-term negative impact, uh, basically on the sales growth. But the and this may be due to the postponement of the new product launches because we have seen that the Indian market usually the growth is through the new product launches. And in these few months, you know, we have not seen any new products, you know, which has been kind of a launch. And I'll uh, also touch base in my uh, the. what is going to happen so what is the new norm for a pharma industry to launch these products you know in a time when the medical representative cannot go and you know meet to the doctors and you know brief about the product so definitely and there are you know a lot of provisions on the marketing of these uh, pharmaceuticals so the regulations are definitely you know this is being kind of a uh, basically we'll see a lot of change and uh, the other day, you know, we were talking about the telemedicine in, a, you know, one of the healthcare uh, webinars. And, uh, you know, it has been said that, you know, telemedicine, a lot of things, it was also under the regulations and they, it has not been kind of a permitted. But, you know, in this duration, we have seen that the regulations has been uh, uh, basically, you know, loosened to say that, you know, people, although other people, you know, can have... Uh, can have the benefit of this kind of a telemedicine and definitely we'll see in the future you know these regulations are going to change and similarly how the product has been briefed to our doctors or how pharma industry is going to work is also going to be changed there is a delay in the non-covid treatments there is a postponement of non-urgent treatment that may be a short term uh, decelerations of the volume growth as i mentioned there is an impact on the apis generic potential APIs and the generic they are in a shortage that can be lead to the medium uh, term price increases. There is an economic impact on the growth prognosis. So due to that a downturn in the economic outlook, they can negatively impact also the pharmaceutical spending in countries with high out of pocket medical expenditures. There is an upsurge in a demand for a symptomatic medicines. So there is a short term boost we have seen in a volume through the retail channels as a public stockpile, NLJ6 and cough and cold preparations. Uh, the face-to-face -face interaction, as I mentioned to you, is minimized. So detailing may lead to a short-term negative impact on the sales. And there is a travel restriction for so medical tourism, you know, one of the uh, sector which was been growing. So there is a short-term negative impact on a pharmaceutical market, which is reliant on the, you know, the medical uh, tourist, tourism. So near-term strategies to assure the core operations is uh, definitely one is to ensure the safety of all employees, including remote and the global workers, uh, identifying the situations that may limit the patient access to uh, the drugs and take action, where the distribution of the drugs may be difficult, there are infused therapies, where patients are unable to get prescriptions refilled, or need the physician consultations, as I mentioned to you, telemedicine is you know one of the uh, sector, you know, which will be booming in the next future and where the patient's funds are, may come under the pressure due to the rising unemployment. There is a use of war room approach to protect the supply of critical products. There is adjustment of the commercial models, personal interactions between sales reps and physicians are curtailed in many regions and uh, the managing clinical trials will be, a, you know, a huge impact. There is a delays or a whole trials for which uh, you know the enrollment has been challenging and uh, engage with the investigations and subjects with essential trials already underway. Uh, the follow up with the FDA, EMA and the regu local regulatory guidelines to manage the patient safety in the ongoing trials. And there is also the considerable changing the locations for patient visits and shipping treatments, you know, basically directly to the patients. And in the long-term strategies, which is to prepare us for the future, there is a re-evaluate portfolios, plans, and forecast, which is based on the potential scenarios in accordance with the portfolio shifts in R&D, and uh, commercial, uh, basically, and adjust the cost structure. There is a de-risk global supply chain uh, that needs to be done, considering the dual sourcing of the critical products of the API and excipients to ensure, basically, the backup of the in the case of the future disruptions, there is a turbo change commercial efforts, proceed with the delayed product launches, restart the field efforts, learn from industry trends that COVID-19 has accelerated, 
such as telehealth, remote medical engagement, focus on right-sizing the companies, the field force and capabilities, and uh, also accelerate the technologies, digitalizations of the value chain, there is the customer engagement and the real-time uh, supply chain monitoring, uh, de-digitalizations of the clinical development, there is an investment in the automation and to reduce the, basically the administrative cost. Besides that, exploring the acquisitions, opportunities, now everyone has realized there is a one world. Uh, there are lower valuations, particularly, you know, basically in the biotech sectors, which may make some targets more, uh, you know, basically are financially visible. Uh, challenges and road ahead, if we say, the COVID-19 crisis has highlighted the importance of a risk management framework. And uh, with a reference to the loss of supply chain, the partners, the location, uh, it would always be prudent to alternate the supply arrangement, which would reduce the potential disruptions while ensuring the adequate stockpile. Uh, digital health become a great focus area in coming months and years. Telemedicine, health-related apps are gaining popularity. There is a increased doctor-patient online interactions due to the current pandemic situation. Even the hospitals in the UK have been instructed by NHS England to increase the telemedicine or the video consultation. There is a focus on self-reliance and India Pharma needs to look inward and start thinking of gaining self-reliance in raw materials, production and free itself for the Chinese dependence. Data analytics is the data in possession of various pharma companies could be used to hasten the drug development by employing specialized uh, software analytics. Um, in a pharmaceuticals, in the present scenario, India's API dependent on China has become a significant threat. So there is a focus on API manufacturing, ease government and policy restrictions on API, adopt a multi-pronged uh, approach both at the federal and state level, the declare API as a strategic sector. In a medical device, again, you know, there is uh, India dependence on China for medical devices, huge from gloves to orthopedic implants and CT and MRI devices. So recent weeks have seen a shortage of in this area. So the government, uh, you know, there is uh, discussions with a FICI PhD chamber, you know, has been asking government to provide a fiscal relief at the various levels and withdraw the health sets and uh, value it detects from a medical devices and allow the undisrupted uh, distribution of medical devices at all levels. So there is a shift focus on development of diagnostic kits, basically in the uh, coming future. Uh, you know, as a lot of youngsters have been, uh, uh, you know, viewing this uh, webinar, so technologies of future, I just wanted to, uh, you know, name them. One is the internet of the things, you know, a lot of apps which you are seeing in a health, uh, even the Apple Watch which you have been wearing, it's all IoT technology, so we'll see the more of this growth. That's the future of our uh, uh, industry. Automations, we've seen that, you know, the automations where there will be uh, uh, even the, you know, the production, manufacturing, uh, the lab practices will be more and more going to be automated. And even in the education sector, we would see that, you know, the lot of laboratory practices probably and in this pandemic time, we have to use this automation. Uh, for, uh, you know, merger requisitions, we already the cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin and the Litecoin we've been talking about, there will be a more use of these technology. Blockchain is uh, another, you know, is for the pharma industries, basically, when we talk about the securities and all in the financial sector, we'll see there is a more application of this in the pharma industry. Artificial intelligence, you know, this is the not the last, is going to be, you know, impacting everywhere in a healthcare sector, may it be a hospital, may it to be a pharma industry, and, uh, you know, it's a booming kind of a sector, so, we, you know, that's a, that's a future and that's the technology, you know, which where, you know, everybody, you know, basically, you know, rest on is to be, you know, focused. So, uh, that was my last slide. Uh, so, thank you very much and uh, I hope, uh, you know, I'll be able to take uh, any questions or anything, you know, which, uh, 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 which basically has been relevant to you. Thank you so much. I'll thank you, ma'am. It was a really a wonderful session. So, within 30 minutes, what not, uh, you have touched production, manufacturing and uh, healthcare systems, telemedicine and uh, 
what is the role of the startups so really it was very informative and i was seeing seeing this youtube and all so that they are just uh, raising like anything so it was uh, within 30 minutes you have uh, touched a lot as there was one important question actually from the audience so right. the, the drug that is a remdesivir right. has undergone phase 3 trials right. so their question is has it found any limitations uh, uh yes limitation is one is the cost another is that it's a injectable so it's okay. been effective like basically from a moderate to severe uh, uh, this uh, the impaction so you know the use of this uh, is again you know we don't have you know a full kind of a trials and there is a lot of uh, the, the thing uh, basically that you know how it is going to take up a shape uh, you know in a pharma industry there is always a pharma lobby so uh, basically uh, we, you know we we are all skeptical and you know wanted to see that you know how it is going to uh, shape up you know in near future about that so that's one of the limitations basically for this uh, while i mentioned about the another promising uh, uh, the oral medication for cinavir that is you know glenmark is already been preparing so i have been talking to some of my colleagues in pharma they said they are all geared up in next 2 to 3 months you know they might be uh, there for the production and this product is already off patent so probably you know that could be a good uh, startup for for india with us thank you ma'am thank you so much so and i would like to thank dr nagesh and also congratulate you and your team so for such an uh, big when you have created so we are gaining such so much knowledge uh, eminent personalities and thanks for the opportunity to introduce such an eminent speaker thank you so much thank you uh, thank you dr vijay it is indeed a great pleasure for society as well because uh, if you heard my uh, yesterday's uh, talk for a society i clearly mentioned that professor Han- harvinder popli she is one of the uh, dynamic uh, member of society and just not the member of the society she is heading the SPER women forum as national president for the same she is currently the vice president for society of pharmaceutical education and research at central as well so that way she has been a close associate of the society as well with her support uh, we have organized few events uh, in dipsaru as well so these are the awareness event that we have uh, initiated for the women uh, forum activities uh, some of the activities that has been like uh, uh, breast cancer testing then some other informative talks uh, i have been visited dipsaru as well for one of the other events so certainly it's a teamwork that ultimately reflected in what the conference we are able to organize so definitely i would like to take the uh, opportunity to thank each one of you all the uh, office bearers of the society all the audience because continuously i am uh, watching on my uh, laptop then the youtube streaming then the website streaming that we have given to the registered members as, as well and everybody i i can feel proud everybody has praised the event they have given that uh, it's a very informative uh, discussion thank you very much for the wonderful session so lot many uh, comments has been given and it's not just the students of the research scholars they are attending the event there are people from the industry they are very senior people from the different academic institutions as well they are witnessing the event because dr popley has a, a legacy as well and so many uh, lot many students uh, she has guided in the uh, masters and doctorate program as well she has been the alumnus or the part and parcel of previously the remexi as well so understanding the fan following of such a eminent speakers if you talk about from <laughs> yesterday's dr yk gupta mr rajkumar sharma dr rakesh kumar sharma dr nk jain professor paul professor shimon said now harvinder popli madam so each one of the speakers that society has chosen for this particular conference they are amongst the top leaders as well so initially uh, i just wanted to thank each one of you for the same and definitely and one more thing that uh, i would like to highlight here uh, being in secretary i can feel proud that each the session that we have taken we have carried out they are continuously strictly following the timeline as well today's event we have to start at 10:30 and sharply 10:30 we started the session and uh, the next session for uh, professor popli was started at sharp 11 o'clock 
now i have also taken 2 minutes for the discussion otherwise we could have started the next session at scheduled time of 11:30 as well so i don't want to uh, interfere in the scientific discussions as well and i would like to invite dr neha jain to introduce our next speaker dr rajesh ji over to you dr neha thank you so much dr neha unmute your mic Hello. Yes, yes Doctor Nair. Now you are audible. Please go ahead for welcoming Doctor. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, hello, everyone. I, Doctor Neha Jain, Assistant Professor, Amity Institute of Pharmacy, Amity University. Welcome you all to the SPER International Online Conference. with the theme of empowering pharmacists for next generation to improve health and wellness it is my immense pleasure to introduce today's speaker mr rajesh tharparambat lss chief group manager in patient medication management services pharmacy services department johns hopkins aramco healthcare behran kingdom of saudi arabia mr rajesh hailing from kozhikode district of kerala completed his Pharm during 91 to 95 and M Pharm during 1996 to 1998, both from the Kia Pharmacy, Sri Ram Krishna Institute of Paramedical Sciences, Coimbatore. Mr. Rajesh has started his career as lecturer in pharmacy at JSS College of Pharmacy, Mysore, during 1998. Since October 2000, he is with the Pharmacy Services Department. Saudi Aramco Medical Sciences Organization currently known as John Hopkins Aramco Healthcare Mr Rajesh is well experienced in pharmacy automation and informatics system implementation his research interests are development of professional community hospital and clinical pharmacy in developing countries technology innovations in pharmaceutical care healthcare economics related projects and adverse drug event monitoring reporting drug induced diseases and quality improved in healthcare i again welcome you sir over to you sir please that is sir hi can you hear me yes yes sir you are audible yes um thank you so much and a very warm good morning from uh, saudi arabia uh, can you see my slides uh, not yes uh, you have to put it on a present now mode okay uh, so uh, please close all the tabs at the upper side all the windows tabs and everything
I'm sorry. Yes, uh, now we are able to see your presentation, uh, Rajesh. Okay, great. Okay, great. Yeah, please go. Please go ahead. So once again, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, very, very good morning from Saudi Arabia. Um, I'm a practicing pharmacist, not like an industrial uh, expert, like um, or academician, like any other uh, um, speakers. So today we'll be discussing about the COVID-19 trends and challenges in, in in the reality in the actual practice of pharmacy. Um, So looking at the timeline, I uh, hope you can hear me now. So can you hear me? Yes, sir. You are audible. You are audible. Okay, very good. Very good. Uh, looking at the timeline from WHO, um, actually the New Year Eve of uh, 2020 started with a, a news from uh, China, uh, Wuhan Municipal Commission. They reported a cluster of cases of pneumonia in Hubei province. And on the first day of 2020, China publicly shared Genetic sequence of uh, COVID-19, which was really helpful for the pharmacy industry as well as researchers, as well as the people who are working for the uh, for the uh, diagnostic modalities in COVID-19. And on 30th of January, officials confirmed a case of COVID-19 in Thailand. This was the first case reported outside the walls of China. And on 22nd, WHO confirmed the human-to-human -human transmission officially. And on 11th of March, on 11th of March 2020, WHO officially declared that the COVID-19 is a pandemic. And by the time, it was already there in most of the countries. And on 18th of um, March, WHO, in partnership with uh, uh, the, the other teams, started or launched a solidarity trial for uh, you know looking at the possibilities different model modalities as well as to create uh, massive data on um, on different treatment modalities, possibilities of treating patients on uh, confirmed cases of COVID-19. So this is what happened exactly for the last uh, six months and these are the important timelines, but uh, the situation still continues. And uh, being a pharmacist working in the reality in the ground level, what are the trends, what are the challenges, what we are really facing at this point of time in terms of uh, pandemic, current pandemic situation. So we'll have pharmacists working. Unfortunately, we'll have uh, pharmacists working in uh, from home nowadays because of the different reasons, because um, you know most of the hospitals, they will have to cut down the, pay, the, the employees who have to get exposed to the hospital environment. So most of the hospital outside, they decided to keep some of the, the staff at home rather than uh, you know, telling them to come every day. So we, uh, or most of the hospital, they uh, created a facility for working uh, pharmacists from home. So this was provided through the VPN as well, as well as uh, it was not possible for all the functionalities in pharmacy, but certain consultations, certain uh, people working in the informatics, pharmacy informatics and administration uh, were able to do it. And uh, on these days, we already saw an improved pharmacy automation, improved utilization of automated uh, systems in the pharmacy, and uh, the, the better utilization of technology as well as automation, including the teleconsultations in pharmacy as well as web-based counseling. So these are the new trends in pharmacy. We used to do it, but not to this extent at this point of time, because the people are, more, uh, people are confined to home, they are quarantined, either quarantined or they have travel restrictions. So there was no other way than reaching the patient by a remote access, something like a teleconsultations or web-based counseling process. Again, for the same reason, the electronic prescribing become more popular and the community pharmacies as well as the hospitals, they started working on a direct delivery to home, the medications, including the discharge medication and the routine supplies. Um, they, they made a partnership with other uh, organizations, uh, for example, the, the logistic companies outside and then started delivering the medications uh, to home directly. So these are the, some of the trends. And uh, more than trends, actually, we got now a lot of challenges, actually, in, in ground reality. Uh, the, one of the main challenges for the clinical pharmacists or the hospital-based pharmacists were the development of institutional guidelines and the protocols. 
for the management of COVID-19 confirmed cases. Uh, we'll talk about the development of uh, guidelines and protocols in detail later, and the utilization of external therapies and the capacity of use of drugs. And we saw a lot of drugs which is used, like non-FDA approved indications was still used. In terms of administration, uh, challenges were still there, including um, hospitals. Most of the hospitals had uh, off-campus quarantine areas. The quarantine areas outside the main campus, and they have to support it in terms of clinically as well as for the logistics terms. So basically, the technology really helped at this point of time. And again, staff challenges, infection prevention and control, managing public information as well as uh, infodemics and the challenges in drug logistics. So coming to the, the first thing, first challenge, which is the development of institutional guidelines. Uh, Why do you have the guidelines? The purpose of guidelines and the protocols in the hospital is to have uh, a standardized uh, care. That means, for example, a given indication. There's a set of orders need to be done, the set of medication need to be ordered, set of labs to be done, either mandatory or on a PRN basis. So uh, we have done um, a set up a multidisciplinary team to look at the different possibilities, to look at the different uh, guidelines available abroad from different countries, from different organizations like WHO, CDC, et cetera. And we started gathering the information from all those sources. And this was truly a multidisciplinary team which contains um, an infectious disease specialist, a hospitalist, clinical pharmacist, uh, respiratory therapist, nursing representatives, quality improvement team, as well as the team members from the healthcare informatics. So we all together, we have to sit together and gather all those information, and we have to review all those information. There was a lot of bunch of information. Some of them were really useful, but some of them not really useful. So we have to really sit and verify those information and the source of information. And uh, once it is gathered, you have to translate those gathered information from reliable sources to an uh, institutional guideline. So basically, once the institutional guidelines are prepared, um, we have to make it like an order set, which is usable in terms of uh, healthcare informatics. It needs to be incorporated into our electronic healthcare system, or EHR. So um, it was uh, prepared as an order set, and it was reviewed finally and got approval from the upper management and it was migrated to the electronic health records. Again, the purpose of doing institution guidelines and protocol is to standardize the care. And on top of everything, like um, we found a lot of experimental therapies. There was no other way, including um, the solidarity trial. As we know that the March 18th, the WHO and the partners, they launched the solidarity trial. So basically, uh, we left the trial was looking at the different possibilities and options and different treatment modalities, diagnostic procedures, uh, which was helpful, which supposed to be helpful for the patient who got confirmed cases of COVID-19. Again, there was a lot of concerns about using experimental therapies, but uh, there was no other way sometimes, you know, rather than uh, waiting for something yet to come. Um, the, the, the only option was to utilize whatever available. Uh, the people were afraid, the people were panicked, um, the information was not proper, confirmed sources, the information was too much sometimes, we don't know which need to be validated or which is not validated, then uh, instead of system to be paralyzed and you know get panic on top of all the things, uh, the, finally the medical uh, team decided to go ahead with experimental therapies. <clears throat> we know that uh, there are ethical issues related to the experimental therapies, including, you know, uh, usually it takes um, eight to ten years to get an approval from uh, US FDA for a new drug from lab to the to the market. But there are provisions for the accelerated drug approvals, but again, uh, which is not practical at this point of time uh, in in virtue of uh, pandemic. Um, usually, the accelerated drug approvals is approving drugs with the less evidence. It's not uncommon. Uh, especially uh, the drugs which already uh, passed the phase two data as well as, um, you know, they get the approval uh, uh, prior getting to the phase three trials. 
or prior completing the, the phase three trials. And the other option to get the medication or to get the patient into the, the medication is that enrolling to the clinical trial. Again, this is a hassle. Again, uh, the prior approval is required. The final option is extended access program with some of the medication, basically uh, using the medications uh, with an unapproved indication uh, on a compassionate ground. So what do you mean by um, compassionate use of drugs? It's a program um, running in most of the countries which is intended to provide potentially uh, life-saving experimental treatments to the patient suffering from disease for which no satisfactory authorized therapy exists or who cannot enter the clinical trial. So basically there is no therapy access or the patient cannot enter a clinical trial uh, due to the life-threatening situations. So for those patients, this is a last hope for most of these patients uh, um, who really request for a compassionate use of drugs. In certain situations, actually, US FDA, they allow the companies to provide the experimental drugs to the people outside the clinical trials. Again, getting access to not at approved drugs through the compassionate use request can be long term and it might take some time and it's a challenging process. Actually, there is an inclusion criteria if you want to be qualified for the use of drugs on compassionate grounds. So what are the inclusion criteria? Actually, the condition need to be really immediate life threatening. There is no other treatment is available, haven't been helped by or approved by uh, any by other treatments. And the patient is not a candidate to be included in the clinical trials. And the treatment team says that there is a poor prognosis for the patient and there is a remote, very remote possibility that experimental therapy may help this patient. And also the, uh, the benefit justifies the potential risk for the treatment and finally, the manufacturer need to agree to provide the drug. So these are some of the criteria. But in Indian context, I'm not sure of what we exactly have it, but in, it's not very common to use the drugs in, in, on a compassionate uh, grounds. Um, there is no formal mention of the term called uh, compassionate use by the uh, CDS Co. But there are provisions in the Drugs and Cosmetics Act you can uh, allow the import of drugs if it is necessary. But again, um, applications can be submitted to um, DCGI by the hospital or a patient or the pharmaceutical company and the compassionate use is something uh, new to India and uh, we are lacking of policies and law uh, related to the compassionate use of drugs. So probably this is something to be discussed in the industrial level as well as on the regulators. As a, as a pharmacist working in, in, a, in a hospital or a, a, an administrator, a pharmacy administrator, um, I'm sure that the audience will be aware of the Joint Commission accreditation um, requirements. They have six international patient safety goals. And one of the main things related to the pharmacy uh, or the medication management in accreditation process, either uh, for the Joint Commission or in, uh, even with uh, NABH, is the uh, the independent double checking of high alert medications. So by process, all the high alert medications, there's a list of high alert medications prepared by the, the organizations like uh, Institute of Safe Medication Practices, and the same thing is adopted by the Joint Commission. And the medications to have an independent double checking. This is a process which is mandatory to avoid devastating errors uh, for the high alert medication. So this is a mandatory process uh, prior to administration of any high alert medication. Some of the examples for the high alert medications are uh, concentrated electrolytes like potassium chloride, the insulins, um, anticoagulating agents, heparins, etc. So these are some of the examples, the TPNs. These are some of the examples for the high alert medications. The, the, the formulations like the total parental nutrition contain a, a cocktail of a high alert medication including the, the electrolytes and heparins and insulins. So it needs to be an independent double checking. It's a mandatory thing. Um, there are practical difficulties to perform an independent double checking in uh, a pandemic uh, scenario like what we have right now. It's not possible. Actually, the process of independent double checking is that 
two nurses, two competent nurses has to calculate the doses, have to look at the orders independently and come together with an agreement that it, this is the right thing, which is ordered by the physician and they confirm that it is the right patient together and the pump, the, order, the pump need to be set together and they need to um, start administering the medication. So this is how usually high alert medications are administered in any of the joint commission accredited hospitals. But again, uh, as we know that there is usually these patients, COVID-19 patients are admitted in the negative pressure rooms for the, uh, for the isolation. There are practical difficulties to perform independent double checking in this uh, scenario. Um, because barcode for the patient, the risk barcode need to be uh, scanned by the system to confirm that this is the right patient. And this barcode scan need to be done at the bedside. To work around, some of the hospitals, what they have planned is that, you know, uh, to keep a barcode outside, the patient barcode, which is not even ideal, it's not safe. But at this point of time, uh, certain hospitals have carefully viewed the risk against the benefits and decided to go ahead with the new process of having a barcode kept outside the room. Again, this is not the safest one, it's a risky, but again, other options in certain situations. Some hospitals, some hospitals, they use automated drug dispensing cabinets. Even our hospital, we have all this uh, dispensing cabinet with us. And we had a lot of challenges uh, related to the automated drug dispensing cabinet in the nursing area, especially in terms of infection comfort. So basically, we have to instruct the nurses to use a clean hands approach, uh, performing hand hygiene um, before and after accessing the dispensing cabinet. This is very important because Usually, this dispensing cabinet are uh, accessed by the nursing utilizing a biometric ID, which is a fingerprint usually, it's, which is a very common thing to use a fingerprint to uh, log on to this uh, automated drug dispensing cabinets. So using a fingerprint on the bio ID reader is again, it's a risk for infection. And some of the organizations, they consider disabling the fingerprint requirements. And instead of that, they started using the situations, I mean, the uh, things like uh, retinal scanning uh, or some of the hospitals, they started using even the access card the, the, instead of the biometric fingerprint identifications. So until the, the, the routine operations are resumed. And also they made it mandatory that to store a container of alcohol gel uh, near to the cabinet so that the pharmacy staff as well as the nursing staff has to decontaminate before and after using the the biometric identification. And another thing was decreasing the traffic and limiting the cross-contamination in the nursing area by the pharmacy. Again, uh, this is again uh, most important in terms of uh, automated drug dispensing uh, system, the hospital which is having the, the automation. Um, one of the things we decided was to temporarily increase in the stock and the bar levels as well as the reorder points of those medications stored in the, the automated drug dispensing stations. Um, and another thing is to store the medication in multiple ADC bins with a fewer doses per bin so that the, the repeated access to the same, same QBs or the same bins can be avoided. And secure as much as medication as possible in the locked leader bins or pockets to avoid the repeated um, uh, unauthorized access to the medications. The pharmacists, especially the clinical pharmacists, were um, very highly involved in the medication reconciliation process in the hospital. Uh, the main, uh, the medication reconciliation is usually done in, in, in care transition points. So usually the, the transition of care happens in different uh, scenarios, like for example, at the time of admission, at the time of transfers between a normal nursing unit to the ICUs or vice versa, or you are transferring the patient to the operating room and coming back or you're transferring the patient to a facility outside your normal uh, hospital, or you're discharging a patient. So this is the place where the uh, complete medication reconciliation is mandatory. Again, this is one of the um, uh, mandatory thing by the Joint Commission. Medication reconciliation is an important uh, accreditation part. So um, in this scenario, in case of pandemic patients, the main uh, points of uh, reconciliation was at the time of admission, transfers, and discharge. So basically, 
you will have to review the existing uh, outpatient medication against the new medication ordered and uh, solve all those discrepancies and the drug interactions, the duplications, and the drug feed interaction at all this point of time. Especially in, the, in terms of transfer, for example, if you have, the patient is transferred outside the outside the an intensive care unit, there could be a lot of medication which you cannot use in a in a non-monitored area. If there is no continuous cardiac monitoring, those medications need to be stopped prior to the transfer to the from the um, intensive care units. And at the time of discharge, again, a thorough medication consultation is required. Clinical interventions at this point of time was very important, especially the patients on hydroxychloroquine. We all knew that there's a lot of issues related to the use of hydroxychloroquine. Uh, there are studies actually, which is already published. Um, the latest one was uh, three days before by uh, published in Lancet regarding the increased mortality related to the use of hydroxychloroquine and um, followed by uh, most of the hospitals, most of the healthcare system nowadays, they stop using hydroxychloroquine as a part of the, the treatment protocol. The main thing uh, we used to monitor if you are, your patient is on hydroxychloroquine is that um, the, the EKG need to be monitored. This is very important because this is one of the tracks with a very high potential to induce uh, acute prolongation, EKG changes, and VT um, um, arrhythmia, in fact. So uh, the, prior to the initiation of the hydroxychloroquine, we need to do a baseline EKG for the patient. After the patient's uh, the QT interval is more than 500, usually the pharmacy will not recommend to start the hydroxychloroquine for such patients. Even after the, uh, you need to have a follow-up EKG in 48 to 72 hours, you need to keep monitoring the EKG for that patient in a periodic interval, just to make sure that there's no QT interval prolongations. Another issue is um, the use of aerosol generating procedures and the dosage forms. The typical example is use of uh, nebulizers for the patients with the confirmed cases of COVID-19 or suspected cases of COVID-19. Uh, any procedures or any dosage forms which, is, which produces aerosol, aerosol generating procedures are not generally recommended for such patients because of the um, isolation. So basically, we need to look at the medication profile in a periodic uh, uh, interval and see no such medications are there. Basically, this is mainly for the for the safety of the staff who is working along with the patient and other patients also. Most of these patients, especially those who are in the intensive care unit, they end up with having secondary bacterial infection either with a positive, gram positive, or negative um, flora. Uh, usually, they start with an antibiotic. And the organization should have a clear anti antibiotic stewardship program to look at the and monitor the antibiotic usage for these patients. Uh, deteriorated renal function is very common in such patients, especially when uh, sepsis in, uh, is really, the rate of sepsis is really high. Um, multi organ failure we are seeing on a routine basis in critically ill patients. So, um, there are medications, there are so many medications which need a renal dosage adjustment at this point of time. So uh, the hospital, most of the hospitals, they will have a policy to look at the uh, renal doses and uh, usually pharmacists will be empowered to do the renal dose adjustment without even uh, discussing with the physician. So you are empowered to do those adjustment based on the patient's renal functions. Pharmacokinetic consultations, again, um, related to the antibiotic and the other medication, including the use of um, the, the drugs like um, vancomycin, the drugs like uh, aminoglycosides. This is very common nowadays. And uh, uh, most of the hospital, again, will have a pharmacokinetic consultation programs and the pharmacists deeply involved in this one, and the routine clinical in intervention and the monitoring uh, follow-up is required for this medication use. And finally, the monitoring the adverse drug reactions also, reporting, monitoring as well as the reporting the ADEs. <coughs> uh, we have seen many reports uh, regarding the, um, the coagulopathy in patients with the confirmed cases of COVID-19. So most of these patients will be on anticoagulation again. Um, you should have a clear anticoagulation protocol for such patients, and that need to be monitored by your clinical pharmacy team. 
patients on uh, uh, ventilator end up with a parental nutrition if it is like a long term ventilation or on ECMO most of the time they end up with a parental nutrition which uh, again farms again play a major role well, in our hospital uh, the complete anticoagulation the parental nutrition pharmacokinetics etc is completely done by the pharmacists the physician just make an order to say that okay start a parental nutrition for so and so indication or start a vancomycin for so and so indication and rest pharmacy will take care of it till the end point and finally, the compassionate use of drugs uh, need to be monitored. The, the, one of the very common things which is happening right now is the compassionate use of drugs like tocilizumab in uh, cytokine uh, uh, strom in patients with the severe COVID or end stage COVID. The other challenges was uh, um, related to the drug logistics. We are facing um, uh, really issues related to the logistics, um, getting supplies on time. Uh, totally cut off uh, supply uh, for various reasons. For example, some of the, the uh, units, pharmaceutical uh, manufacturing units were shut down due to the quarantine, or uh, some of the logistics got uh, cut down because of the travel uh, restrictions, uh, flight restrictions, etc., etc. So uh, drug shortages were an issue. Uh, from the ground level, pharmacists, what we are doing right now is that looking at the patient profile again deeply and we just look at the profile review on a daily basis and remove all the irrational therapies, remove all the unnecessary medication, especially for the patients who are critically ill, uh, who are on uh, something called as uh, do not associate status. Um, we are stopping all the medications like uh, statins, etc., for such situations, which likely to unlikely to provide any benefit in such scenario. And we got an IV2PO program running in our hospital even and most of the hospitals they have, again, the pharmacists are free to review the medication, especially the antibiotic and other medications, and with an inclusion as well as exclusion criteria. And if the patients meet a criteria, uh, pharmacists are free to convert the IV medication to an equivalent dose of uh, oral. Uh, there are a lot of advantages out of this. Is uh, The main advantage is that we knew that uh, along with the IV medication, we are spending extra money, for example, at least $10 for the other supplies like tubings and the stuffing, etc. So uh, we can cut a lot of money and we can save a lot of tubing here, IV tubings, and the time here for converting the medication to equivalent oral medications. And the possibilities of, uh, uh, there, are, there were experiments and studies related to the use of common canister protocols for the multi-dose inhalers in some of the hospitals. Uh, this was actually, this study came before the uh, uh, COVID pandemic as a, one of the cost saving initiatives. Uh, again, the purpose is like use the same uh, inhaler or a, a multi-dose inhaler canister for multiple patients, which is not a usual practice, but certain hospitals, they experimented, experimented on this as a cost saving thing. But now, uh, to save the logistics, save the supply of the medication, of course, to an extent we can try that. Uh, but again, there is a very high risk involved with uh, the use of um, common canister. That means a single canister of a multi MDA using an, um, a volumetric spacer, uh, individual spacer, not a common one, uh, with uh, different patients. So this is a possibility, but again, there is a risk involved, especially for the patient who is uh, already immunocompromised. So this is not a, a very suggestive one. Very high volume of information was uh, flowing through the social media all these days uh, regarding the pandemic. And uh, the, the technical team uh, we give now is the infodemics now. And the WHO has to set up a team, in fact, to combat uh, the issues related to the infodemic. People become really panicked and they started looking at the medication, they started looking at the information, started getting the hospital started getting the panic calls, uh, led to the infodemic, uh, led to the, the information flowing through the social media, WhatsApp and Facebook and uh, Twitter and etc. Um, one of the consequences of uh, this infodemic was the over the guard of counter use of drugs like uh, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. This was very common. And we already have the reported cases in some countries related to the inappropriate use of hydroxychloroquine, uh, which we already mentioned that the, the issues related to hydroxychloroquine, even in recommended doses, uh, there is a possibility for acute prolongation. 
um, uh, rhythm changes, yes, which need to be monitored frequently. So there were deaths reported uh, due to the over-the-counter use of hydroxychloroquine and some other threats. And also, we saw the uh, the situations like the the public started consuming the antiseptic solutions, um, the isopropyl alcohol disinfectant solution, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And at one point of time, the manufacturer for one of the disinfectant solution has to come up with a, a public notice regarding the improper use of disinfectants, which says that under no circumstances, no one should ingest or uh, inject the disinfectant. Staffing was, is really challenging in this pandemic situation for uh, so many various reasons. Um, quarantine, some of the staff, hospital staff were quarantined because of the, the contact isolation. And uh, a small group of uh, staff were infected. Um, actually, uh, if you look at the, the reports on some of the countries, like uh, example last week, there were like five deaths reported for the pharmacy staff in, from Egypt only. So there were uh, so many staff got infected in various parts of the world. And uh, low staffing availability for so many reasons, again, due to the quarantine as well as the infection and uh, travel restrictions, et cetera. And also, um, we have to run the show with the minimum available staffing, which end up with a very high uh, level of uh, staff uh, stress, anxiety, as well as the burnout. So once again, um, uh, pharmacists at this point of time, at the, at the, at the era of um, pandemic, we are playing a major role as a member of a multidisciplinary care team, um, not only in the hospitals, in the research, in the, in the academies, the manufacturing, and also in the community level. And the time is very challenging uh, for frontliners as well as for the decision makers, managers, et cetera, for various reasons. And on top, top of everything, what I personally feel that this is the one of the best learning opportunity to be on, on front line right now. Uh, probably it's a lifelong experience which you are not going to face uh, never in your lifetime. And thank you so much once again. We are all responsible to combat the pandemic now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, the deliberation was very informative and gave a good insight into the pharmacy practice at this time of pandemic. The discussion nicely covered the multidisciplinary chain setup, healthcare informatics, ethical issues, uh, high alert medications, drug logistic problems, and automated drug dispensing systems. Thank you so much, sir, to make us aware about the current scenario. Uh, it was very nice to introduce you, and it was my privilege to introduce you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I invite Nagait, sir. Uh, Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Neha. Is there any uh, uh, question for the session? If anything, you can ask uh, to the speaker as well. Sure, sir. Uh, Rajesh, sir, uh, there is a query uh, from Ashita George. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, okay, okay. Uh, due to COVID-19, the doctors are more engaged with the treatment in such scenario. What are your views on pharmacists with a family background? manage clinics in India? <clears throat> okay, um, actually for me, I'm working for Saudi Arabia with the John Hopkins right now. We got a beautiful team of clinical pharmacists uh, mm -hmm. from various parts of the world, including from US and other parts of the world. And uh, we are actually involved from top to bottom from starting, as we mentioned earlier, uh, you know, providing a guidelines to the routine daily monitoring of the patients. But it's so unfortunate that even now, even there's a very high requirement for the staffing, very uh, high requirement for the clinically trained staff. We are not utilizing the talents of our young PharmD graduates in Indian environment. This is so unfortunate. I think the government organization need to look at this issue now. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, You're welcome. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Rajesh and Dr. Neha, for your coordination and such a wonderful uh, talk by uh, Mr. Rajesh. Really, we appreciate a lot. So, thank you so much. Yes, and at this time, I would like to uh, 
see that in from the morning one of the very eminent person professor nk jensen is also uh, attending all the uh, event scientific discussions although he has done his scientific talk yesterday as well but we are really very fortunate enough sir to uh, see you on second day as well and from very starting of the session in the morning only you joined so thank you so much for your presence sir and yeah, I, I, I i'm thankful to you because i'm uh, enjoying and i'm learning many many things which i am not really familiar with thank you so much right, sir so uh, sir if you wanted to add on something any point of your view any concern because now we have uh, come up at the end of the uh, conference as well we have done with all the scientific talks started from you then dr paul then dr shuman said dr sharma dr kopli and mr rajesh so if you wanted to conclude anything scientifically from your side or your perception your view so that would ultimately enlighten each one of us and uh, students faculties they are eagerly waiting to once again hear from your side as well sir oh thank you so much but uh, uh, i am uh, really very happy uh, to be part to be a part of this particular conference uh, an international conference and uh, i got a very good exposure uh, with uh, so many eminent speakers uh, with young people who are attending the conference and uh, the queries and the response the overwhelming response to you have got it's really encouraging and i hope that you will keep it up of course you are very very active in the group uh, in the country uh, i wish all the best for your uh, efforts and uh, your uh, say society itself thank you very much thank you thank you so much sir thank you so much my my blessing to have been associated with this and uh, in future also i think we can uh, contribute in uh, this particular noble uh, i would say uh, uh, noble cause so far as the farm system powering is concerned thank you right thank you so much sir thank you so much for your enlightened words sir so before uh, giving the mic to dr indarbir singh for the formal vote of thanks i just wanted to share few points and few observations for these two days international conference starting from yesterday uh, i tell you we are able to see more than 5000 views for the youtube channel for the yesterday's event only and uh, that was in less than 24 hours we are able to see more than 5000 views that is very tremendous response i can say that we have received and at the same time uh, i would like to add on for the uh, young scientists young buddies as well those are witnessing those are attending the events that society of pharmaceutical education and research is fully committed to empower the pharmacists to work for them and certainly we consider the pharmacists the young pharmacists as a future of our country definitely it is your sole responsibility to contribute for the nation building and we at sper would like to invite each one of you to join sper to be a part of sper student forum to work for your profession because although we could have n number of grudges uh, with the profession n number of negativity that uh, that has to be done there has to be some more uh, inclination towards the study research and everything but certainly we have to understand what as a individual as a student you have contributed for the profession it's our sole duty to contribute it's not always that we are criticizing the profession if you have the uh, talent you have the stamina you have that kind of zeal to work for the profession then why not you should take the charge you should take the lead and work for the profession so that what are the uh, problems issues associated with the profession if any certainly you will be able to play a wider role for the advancement and to uplifting the profession as well so my humble uh, humble submission to all the young pharmacists that you can join the society you can see the various activities that has been done by the society as of now in the past 10 years for the young scientists for the young buddies for the women scientists as well you can be a part of the society you can take the lead as the state president state vice president secretary joint secretary in the student forum if you are a women scientist women uh, research scholar or a faculty member or industry personnel you can very well join the sper women forum that is currently headed by one of the dynamic uh, leader professor harvinder popli as well so you can work for the profession because there is a high time we cannot blame anybody for anything if we are blaming anybody then we have to realize our own potential ke whether we have done anything for the profession or not so that is one point 
and I wanted to highlight this particular point because I am very sure these lectures would be uh, publicly online and they will be remain online for the coming years to come. So I wanted to add on this thing. If we are not satisfied with the profession, if we are demanding anything from the profession, then certainly, first of all, you have to have a zeal to give back to the society. You have to work for the society. You have to show your talent for the society. And that way you will be able to ultimately uh, contribute for the nation building that I always wanted to do for the nation. Because ultimately, as an individual, we are nothing. If our profession is not uh, growing, if our profession is not flourishing, and if as a professional we are not able to uh, get the uh, decorum or our dignity as well. So this is not the responsibility of any individual, any person or any society. It's a matter of nation building. Each one of us should contribute. We should always feel proud to be a pharmacy uh, person. We should always proud to be a pharmacist. And we should always work wholeheartedly without any motivation or without any sort of thing that we'll be getting something out of it. Without any expectation, you can work for the profession. And for this, I can assure you from the SPER point of view, from the uh, central SPER being holding a responsible position of National Secretary for Society, I am committed to adhere with the code of conduct of the society. We are definitely willing to take you people as a, a main a partner, main channel for the strengthening of the society as well. So after this discussion, definitely I want to witness few of the uh, very active people to join SPER to work for the society, to work for the nation so that we will be able to achieve the vision of the society. We will be able to achieve the vision to being a pharmacist, to serve the mankind, to serve the healthcare professionals as well. So with these words, I wanted to thank once again each one of you for your elaborative discussion, your such an eminence discussion to the topic over the COVID-19 scenario as well. I must congratulate and thank all the office bearers of Society of Pharmaceutical Education and Research at Central or State for giving their 100% support for making this event a grand success. I can say this is the first event in the country which has been conducted by a national society and received a huge response in a short time duration as well. So with these words, I would like to thank each one of you, all the participants, those are attending the events on the weekdays, like Saturday and Sunday as well. So you deserve a round of applause as well from my side. And thank you so much for being so kind. Over to you, Dr. Indervir, for official vote of thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Nagaj. The best and beautiful things in the world cannot be seen or even touched. They can only be felt by heart. Thank you is one such word. I, Indarveer Singh, National Joint Secretary of SPER, feel privileged to present the vote of thanks for concluding the two days international online conference organized by Society of Pharmaceutical Education and Research, supported by Confederation of Indian Pharmaceutical Industry, Systopic Laboratories, New Delhi, SPER Market Research, NOIDA, and ISF College of Pharmacy, MOGA. The theme of the conference was empowering pharmacists for next generation to improve healthcare and wellness. The inaugural session started with the welcome address by Professor G.D. Gupta, President of SPER, inaugural address by Mr. P.K. Datta, Managing Director, Systopic Laboratories, keynote address by Dr. Y.K. Gupta, President Ames Bhopal, special address by Mr. R.K. Sharma, Scientist FDST, and welcome address by Dr. Upendra Nagaj, Secretary SPER, Dr. Satish Sardana, Director, MIT University Manasar, and Professor Ranjit Singh, Pro Vice Chancellor, Shobit University, Saharanpur. The scientific sessions started with expert talks by Professor N.K. Jain from Dr. H.S. Gaur University, Sagar, Dr. Paul Heng, NSU, Singapore, and Dr. Ponsek from Silpakon University, Thailand. A healthy panel discussion was held on the topic COVID-19 impact and opportunities on pharmaceutical industry. The second day of the conference witnessed scientific sessions by Dr. R.K. Sharma, Vice Chancellor, SIMATS Chennai, Dr. Harvinder Popli, Officiating Registrar and Dean of Depsaru, and Mr. Rajesh T. from John Hopkins Healthcare Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. We are really thankful to all the experts for sparing their valuable time and sharing their thoughts. As already conveyed by our uh, Honorable Secretary, SPER is committed for the upliftment of the profession of pharmacy and promotion of 
pharmaceutical research and development sper has constituted women forum student forum and is actively organizing conferences and technical symposia through this forum i would like to urge the students researchers scientists and faculty members to join sper for the betterment of the profession and for serving the society at large in the end i would like to thank all the participants for their overwhelming response moderators and our it team for effectively managing the event thank you stay home stay safe stay healthy thank you one and all jai hind thank you sir thank you over to you dr nagaj thank you so much dr indarveer for your tremendous vote of thanks as well and with these words we are now concluding the two days international conference as well and look forward for some other events some other knowledgeful informative events of society of pharmaceutical education and research so stay tuned stay follow at instagram facebook twitter linkedin and recently we have come up on youtube as well so certainly these channels would be able to give you a updated scenario about the activities of the society and stay home stay safe thank you so much jai hind thank you all the best thank you all thank you everyone